everybody. Welcome back to Game Time with John Eads. Appreciate you tuning in today. Again, new episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. You can find us online at wafb.com slash game time on our 9 News app, WAFB Plus on Roku TV, and also on YouTube. Just look up WAFB. Be sure to turn on those post notifications because the episodes are Tuesday and Thursday, and if you want to just watch individual cut-ups, we have those as well, and you'll get alerted when those are posted. And while you're at it, like the video, subscribe to the channel as well. Follow my personal socials too if you want to see some teases and just keep up with everything LSU, Southern Saints, everything else. On the X app, it's at John Eads WAFB, and then John Eads TV on on Instagram. Four more topics today. LSU football, of course. Season opener's coming up soon. The Saints have another preseason game on Sunday night against the Chargers. And we're even getting into Southern football as well. Kevin Batiste of WAFB will join the show later on. So let's dive right in. Starting with LSU football and what I think is one aspect and one word that could prevent this team from accomplishing what many think they will accomplish this year. And that word is depth. Brian Kelly said it on the record during the offseason. The Achilles heel of this LSU football team is that depth. And it's at a couple of different positions. I want to dive into specific positions that I think this team might be one, two injuries away from really having some serious problems. Now, let's start with wide receiver. It's a team that, or rather a position group that has a lot of talent, top-heavy talent as well, but kind of dies off after that. Malik Neighbors is your wide receiver one. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. He's back. Your wide receiver two last year was Kayshawn Butte. He's now with the Patriots in the NFL and having a great camp, by the way. So somebody has to fill his role. Behind Butte last year was Mason Taylor. But the problem there is that Taylor plays tight end, not wide receiver. So you'd like to have another wide receiver producing more than your tight end because they should be catching the ball. You would think in most situations... A little bit more than your tight end. So who are some of the guys that could fill that role? Brian Thomas. We've talked about him quite a bit on this show. He's had two different 300-plus yard receiving seasons. Really just not wide receiver two-esque numbers. What are we looking for? 45 catches, 600 yards, handful of touchdowns. A, a consistent, reliable target that will make plays. Kyron Lacey could also do that. The former Louisiana Lafayette player had 24 catches for 268 yards last season. His best year, though, came during his freshman season when he was with the Raging Cajuns. He had 364 receiving yards that year. Um, so we haven't seen him produce at that level yet. And at that level, that's wide receiver three numbers. If Lacey wants to fulfill his potential, he's got to boost that up this year. But he impressed in the spring had a one-handed catch in the spring game, so he's certainly flashed, as has Thomas, but can they show that consistency? That's really the big question, because if teams game plan, which they will, to stop Malik Neighbors, other dudes are going to have to elevate their levels of play and make plays to fill that void. So Thomas, Lacey, maybe Chris Hilton, he's had a really good camp, and good reports coming from camp for the former five-star receiver. Can he build on what he did last year, which was just a seven-catch 109-yard season. Either way, they got to find a couple of guys to be reliable targets for Jaden Daniels because if Neighbors goes down with injury, this unit's in trouble. But even if Neighbors is fully healthy, they need other people to throw to and move this offense down the field methodically. Okay, defensive side of the ball. The two biggest question marks, I think, for depth and position groups, defensive line and cornerback. In that D-line room, you never want your starters to have question marks next to their name, and there's a couple of guys that have them. First, Savion Jones, another guy we've talked about and discussed a little bit. He started three games last season, had 23 tackles, four and a half sacks, so a little bit of production, but now he's really taken on a bigger load on his shoulders, hoping, you would think, to start 12, 13, 14 games this year. He hasn't done that yet. So he's going to be relied upon not just as a role player and an occasional run stuffer and pass rusher. He's supposed to be basically in every down defensive end. Behind him, say Jones struggles or gets injured, you got Quincy Wiggins, who played in five games last year at five tackles. So capital U, unproven. And then Deshaun Womack, who we talked about last episode, the five-star true freshman who hasn't played a college game yet. Yep, also getting great reports in fall camp, but you gotta see it on the field in a game-like scenario. And at this juncture, I'm not too confident saying Womack can step in 
and be a guy that can do what Jones does at the same level or better or even close to the level expected. How about Mason Smith at D-Tackle? You might be quick to say, that's not a question mark. What are you talking about, John? But look, guys, he's coming back from injury. Played one game. We'll round up and give him the one game last year. He got injured early in the Florida State contest celebrating. He's been recovering, rehabbing. Should be back to near full health, but recently he's been just doing individual drills and hasn't been participating that much in fall practice, fall camp. And Brian Kelly said recently that they're kind of taking it slow with Smith and really just kind of protect him and, and really evaluate him so he doesn't have any more injury problems. So he should be back in game shape, but he hasn't played a game in a long time. So we can't just assume that he's going to step in and be an all-SEC defensive tackle. Behind him, Jacoby and Guillory, a very veteran guy, but a guy that's only started two times in three years at LSU. So if Smith struggles with production, just full health in general, Guillory can be a short-term replacement, but he's not going to play at the level you want from an SEC defensive tackle alongside Makai Wingo. Now, on the other side of that D-line, Ovia Gufu, he's not a question mark at all. Transfer from Texas, we've talked about him too. Really good player from the Longhorns, but behind him you got Braden Swinson, who's played in that jack spot, the hybrid linebacker D-line spot. The transfer from Oregon, who played 30 games there, only started one though. He's gotten good reports out of camp. He's been playing well, getting a lot of reps there, but still we haven't seen him play consistently since the 2021 season when he played in 11 of 14 games but saw his role diminish towards the end of the season. And since he's been at LSU, haven't heard much from him. Then Jackson Howard's behind Switzerland. He's a true freshman. So D-line, if you got injuries, you got issues there, you're really going to be in trouble. And then cornerback. This really got amplified this week with the Denver Harris stuff. Two new starters. Zy Alexander, the FCS transfer from Southeastern Louisiana. Deuce Chestnut. Alexander was an All-American at the FCS ranks, but he's going from that to the SEC. That is a big jump, okay? And it's the jury's kind of still out on whether that jump is going to go seamless or not. And Harris was battling Alexander for that job, and I think that was a position battle that was going to go into the season. Well, now we don't even know if Harris is going to be on the team when the season starts. He wasn't in the team photo. Brian Kelly says that he's got to take care of some personal stuff off the field and could be back on the team later this week. So who knows with that? And then Chestnut, he was really good at Syracuse. I saw him play a lot of ball. Behind him, though, was J.K. Johnson. He got injured recently, was in a boot, and Kelly told us when we were at the food bank event that he'll be out indefinitely with an injury. So at corner, you're extremely, extremely thin. You're relying on transfers to begin with, and you've really got nobody behind those guys unless Harris gets back on the team and can work his way back into a role. So really uh, some reasons to be concerned there. There's also some issues at linebacker and safety good starters but who's behind them big question marks and not to mention LSU's schedule this year is really tough 13th hardest schedule in the country according to Phil Steele so when you're going at it every single week in the SEC this rigorous schedule you're gonna have guys get some bumps and bruises and other players will have to step in and at least play a couple of snaps and help out and reprieve I'm not sure LSU will have that luxury this year and you can't go 13, 14, 15 games with the same 22 guys playing every snap. There's going to be injuries. There's going to be guys that are going to miss a game here and there, a drive here and there. You've got to be able to have backups, secondary, tertiary players step in and fulfill those roles. And from where I'm standing right now and where we are time-wise ahead of the season, I'm just not so sure that LSU has that capability. That's something this team will need to answer throughout the season if they want to win a national championship. Okay, continuing on with LSU football and a series we started last episode. It's called Freshman Familiarity. What we're trying to do is give you guys insight on some true freshmen that could see the field this year and play a pretty big role for this football team. Last episode, it was Deshaun Womack, a defensive lineman. Today, it's Ashton Stamps, a guy from Louisiana, a three-star cornerback who was ranked outside the top 600 nationally, the number 44 corner in the 2023 class, and someone that I don't think many people expected to be talked about right now and, and beyond that play this season. He was a summer enrollee, which means he missed all of spring ball. He didn't get to LSU until the summer, and usually when you enroll early, you kind of have a leg up on the other freshmen who come in during the summer, but 
We'll talk about this a little bit. Stamps has had a unique opportunity here. He was the number 19 prospect in LSU's class. He was really towards the bottom. And when you think about freshmen having a big freshman season and playing a role for this team, you look at the top one, two, three, maybe five to ten guys in the class as dudes that could play well because usually the highest ranked prospects. And the point here is that Stamps wasn't one of those guys, but it doesn't matter because the reports we're receiving and seeing and reading, and if you go to practice, you'll see Stamps. He's making plays. He's in man coverage, knocking down passes, covering dudes in good position. A lot of people are very optimistic that Ashton Stamps could play a role in this cornerback room, whether it be a rotational role, maybe even a starting role. A little more on this guy. He played at Archbishop Rummel, which is the same school that Jamar Chase played high school ball at, and Christian Fulton. Two guys that were on LSU's 2019 National Championship team and were really good players, now playing in the NFL, obviously. So, hey, maybe Stamps is the next excellent product from that high school to come to LSU and just ball out. As I said, getting a lot of buzz. If you look up any articles on showouts, standouts at fall camp, this guy's name is on there, Ashton Stamps, okay? And he's had the opportunity here to take advantage, as I said, of a unique situation. Usually when you come in as a freshman corner, you need a couple of years to adjust to the college game. Unless you're a really highly rated prospect who played the elite levels of high school football like Deshaun Womack did. Not to say that Stamps didn't, but when you're ranked kind of where he is ranked, what people are suggesting as a three-star is that you need a season or two, a redshirt year, to learn the system, improve a little more physically, and adjust to the speed of the college game. But it seems like that transition has been really good. He's fit in perfectly right away here. And what helps is that, as we just discussed in the first segment, check it out if you missed it, Denver Harris has had off-the-field issues. He's not on the team right now. Nobody really knows what his situation is. He could rejoin the team this weekend. Point is, he's not on the field getting reps into practice, and he's not backing up Zy Alexander or Deuce Chestnut. So what does that mean? That means Stamps gets more reps, and he's taking those reps and taking full advantage. On top of that, J.K. Johnson, the other transfer who is battling Deuce Chestnut and Alexander for a starting job, he's injured, unfortunately. Was on a boot recently, and Brian Kelly said that he'll be out for an indefinite period of time. It seems like a pretty long time. So Ashton Stamps has had the reps needed to learn this defense, to adjust to the speed of the game, take his lumps from Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas and Chris Hill and whoever. I mean, pick a name, you name a name, whatever it may be. Point is, he's ready to go. Iron has been sharpening iron here in fall camp, and Stamps has had an early opportunity to get film on tape, show the coaches what he can do, and make some plays for his teammates to see, for coaches to see, for us, the media, to see. So this is a name that's generating a lot of buzz, and with all the question marks in the secondary right now, this is a guy that could see himself get on the field and get opportunities week one, week two, week three, and if he takes those opportunities, rolls with them, runs with them, he could just get even more chances. Because Zy Alexander and Deuce Chestnut are your penciled-in starters for now, I would say, at corner. Alexander's coming from the FCS. Big jump. We've talked about it. How's he going to fit in? We'll see. Chestnut coming from Syracuse in the ACC. ACC, SEC, there's definitely a little bit of a difference there in the type of athlete I think that plays in those conferences. Now, Chestnut was a freshman All-American at Syracuse, so he's got the pedigree to start. But if these guys struggle with the system, really just with the speed of the game in the SEC, maybe a guy like Ashton Stamp steps in. And if he locks down... He's going to get even more starts moving forward. So Deshaun Womack, look out for him on the D-line. In the back end, I think Ashton Stamps is a name to know. If you see a Stamps jersey on the field, now you know who it is, okay? I think what is most likely to happen here is he gets in spot duty in the first couple of weeks of the season. Definitely plays a lot in the games where LSU should blow out the teams they're playing. Some of those softer opponents on the schedule, not many of them. And then maybe once midseason rolls around, he's regularly in the rotation. If someone's making a bad play, if someone just doesn't have their A game on a particular day, Stamps goes in, he plays. So, Ashton Stamps, now you're familiar with him. Look out for him this season for the LSU Tigers in the defensive secondary. Another weekend on the horizon, which means another Saints game, preseason game number two for New Orleans on the West Coast against the L.A. Chargers coming up on Sunday, a little after 6 o'clock. Now, 
something to follow in this game. You know, there's a lot of different directions I could have gone here. I wanted to kind of talk about Derek Carr and the offense and how good they looked, specific guys in the defense. I want to see a little bit more from certain guys, though, before we kind of dive into those topics. What is so pressing for me is something we've talked about, I feel like, ad nauseum on game time recently is Zach Bond in that linebacker three position. Who is going to take it? Is it Bond? Is it Anthony Barr, who they flirted with signing but haven't signed yet? Or maybe Anferny Orgy, the rookie out of Vanderbilt, who wears number 58. Here's something if you missed it. He was the second highest rated rookie for this past week by Pro Football Focus, rookie defender. Only behind Elias Ricks, the Eagles corner who had a pick six. When you do that, you're going to be number one, obviously. Former LSU player, too. Interesting enough. Now, Orgy was right behind number two. And he really looked impressive in the preseason game. He had four tackles. He's six foot two, two thirty. Just a really good athlete. The question for me is the same question I have with Zach Bond: Can he be a dual threat linebacker? Can he stuff the run, rush the pass, and cover? So I want to watch out this week specifically for Orgy to find out if he could be that guy. Big fifty-eight. Can he cover a running back? Can he cover a tight end? Because Zach Bond didn't show me he could do it in this first game. And he hasn't shown that he could do it in any of the games he's played so far in New Orleans. There was one play, and I talked about it in the last episode, where the running back went out on a play-action pass, and he was three steps behind. And again, this is a top-tier athlete. There's no reason why he should be three steps behind a running back on a play like that. Beat for a 12-yard game. Can Orgy use his athleticism? And, and whatever he's taken from this system, maybe it's just his mental instincts as a football player to stop routes like that. Because here's the deal, guys. Demario Davis, he didn't play week one. I don't know how much he's going to play in the preseason. Who cares? I mean, he's a pro bowl linebacker, all pro every year. He's a stud. Pete Warner did well while he was on the sideline this past week, and Warner's going to be your linebacker too. Those spots are solidified. But this ties in well with what we talked about to open up the show today, LSU football's depth. The Saints have a depth crisis on their hands as well, and it's at this linebacker spot. Because Caden Ellis is now with the Falcons. He's no longer here. He was a really good player at that LB3 spot last year. And you thought Zach Bond would just slide right in, right? The former third-round pick in 2020. But he hasn't, and he just hasn't shown the ability to fulfill the role you need and to earn that second contract with New Orleans. And so he could certainly still do that in weeks two, weeks three, weeks four of the preseason here. And then, of course, into the regular season, assuming he gets the opportunities. But <laughs> the start wasn't promising. But when you see a guy like Orgy getting rated so highly as a rookie, I mean, that's very promising. So I urge you to watch out for Orgy in this second game. Number 58. Bond wears number 53. Just watch those two. Bond's probably going to play a lot of the snaps early in the game. Just take notes or just take mental notes of what you see from him, what you like, what you don't like, and then watch Orgy when he plays, which will probably be the second, third, and fourth quarters. Maybe he gets some first-team reps. I mean, if he played like he did against the Chiefs, he'll certainly earn some of those. And just think about who you would rather have at that linebacker spot. Specifically, again, the coverage. That's the biggest question for me. Bond was good against the run. He had a handful of tackles, even had a sack. That's not the question. As a linebacker, you got to be able to do both. Stop a run, rush the passer, and cover. That's what's going to earn you money. That's what's going to win you football games. If you have the ability to play a multiple defense, not just go straight nickel. When you bring an extra cornerback into the game, take out a linebacker. Because when you play nickel defense, teams are more inclined to run the football. Because you've got a guy that lays less, uh, lays less, weighs less, and can't stop the run as well as a linebacker would. But if you've got that dual threat linebacker that can stop the run, rush the passer, gets the triple threat, and cover, you're good. So between Orgy or Bond, you hope you have that. Otherwise, you don't, and you'll have to go to free agency and get an Anthony Barr or somebody else to fulfill that role, kind of like you're doing with running back to find what you need at that position, but you'd rather just develop the guys you've already got on your roster. You've got two options here, maybe some others as well. One of the two have to pan out. So, two number 50s to watch this week. 53 Bond, and then 58 Orgy. And let's come back and circle back to this topic after the Saints play the Chargers, and we'll recap who we thought played better. But between those two guys, the Saints need a linebacker three. So we'll find out who it is.
Okay, let's round out the show with the last topic, but certainly not the least topic because we talk a lot about LSU football and the Saints, two teams that have big expectations this season, two very talented football teams. This is another one. Let's talk Southern Jaguars football with WFB Zone, Kevin Batiste. Kevin, welcome. Be sure to follow him on the X app, all the social media's info is down below. Kevin's been following this Southern team for a couple of years and Last season was really impressive. Seven and five, year one for Eric Dooley, perhaps better than some people expected. What can they do in year two to be even better? Johnny all comes down to the quarterback. I mean, that was the real Achilles heel for Southern last year. I mean, they, they ran the ball like they usually do. They had a good crop of receivers. Their defense was at the top of the swag, well, top half of the swag, top 10 in the FCS. But it all comes down to who is, who is the QB1. Deshaun McCray, he was subpar to say the least. Can Harold Blood be that guy that they've been lacking since 2017? And so far, he's been showing that on camp. He's been having good command of the offense. He's been getting the timing down with his wide receivers. He has a good bond with his receivers and his offensive line. And that's really all that comes down to. Blood got a little bit of time last year. I think he played in six games last season. So he got a little bit of experience, but now you're looking for him to step up from kind of a rotational guy, a guy that sees a little bit of the field to being the guy, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, those six games, I mean, it, it was pretty much garbage time. I mean, they won games was against Floyd Memorial, and they was up by like 60. It was 80 to nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, they was up by like 60, 80 points. The other time was, was Virginia Lynchburg. He came in in serious time mm. in the SWAC championship, okay. but Dooley kind of had that a little mismanaged. But now, like I said, it, it is all him. And one thing that I learned when talking to these guys for our special is a uh, new wide receiver, Jalen Howard, comes in from Prairie View. He calls blood a dog. Mm. He, he calls him a dog. He says he likes out after practice. He's in the weight room at 10 p.m. watching film. He wants to know the exact timing, the speed, how these receivers get down pat. So, so far, they're believing in number nine right now. And for those who don't know, being called a dog is a good thing. Mm -hmm. That's something you want to have, especially your teammates and teammates on the offensive side of the ball talk to you about. I'm glad you mentioned offense, though, because I found something pretty interesting with doing a little bit of research on this team from last year. It seems like in the games they lost – it's because the offense didn't really produce. So in games where they failed to score 25 or more points, they were 1-4. and four. Do the math, they finished 7-5. and five. That means they were 6-1 and one in games where they did score 25 points or more. What gives with that? I think it all just comes down to, to, to mental toughness. I mean, one thing I've learned about Southern, not just last year, but in years past, they don't know how to come back when they get down. You know, hmm. in, the, in the past, they were like a, a real running team. Now they're trying to become this pass-heavy team. Once they get down double digits, it's like motion starts sinking, the camaraderie gets down. I think it all just comes down to, to mental toughness and being able to sustain that for 60 minutes. Interesting. And you think the offense you think will be more prolific than last year, the guys they got right now, if I put you on the spot here? I think so. I think so. Uh, one thing that head coach Eric Dooley says is you know, they're going to become more balanced. I feel like that down the line last year, once they realized that Bashar McCray had his struggles, they just had to – be real conservative, run the football, mm -hmm. not really take many shots downfield. And when they did take their shots, they didn't connect. So I think you're going to see a real more balanced offense from, uh, from Southern this year. And one thing about Blood, he does have a cannon. Okay. He can sling it. That's good to know. Yeah. And Dooley's an offensive coach too, right? He had yeah. prolific offenses at Prairie View A&M, which is where he was before. Those running backs too, they had a couple of young running backs last year. I think you've already done a story mm -hmm. on those running backs. Tell me about that room a little bit. Well, they lost two. They okay. lost two guys in J.J. Sims and Carl Ligon, two of the top five rushers from last year. That hurts. But they, they, they reloaded mm -hmm. pretty cool, fast at that position because they bring back a guy in Kendrick Grimes who kind of had a little breakout as a freshman last year, especially in that UAPB game where he scored three touchdowns. And they bring back Kobe Dillon. Now, Kobe Dillon in high school, he was a quarterback. Mm. But in the offseason of 2021, right before the fall season, he was a scout team quarterback, but he wanted to get on the field. So he said, hey, he told the then head coach, I'll play running back. And he just so happens to later in that season break the single game rushing record at Southern for rushing. No the, kidding. Yeah. That's yeah. quite Two, a story. 267 yards against UAPB. So, and then he tore his ACL, suffered a severe knee injury last year. So now he's looking real fresh, real spry in camp. He says he feels like he's back to 100%. So look for him to have a big year. And then they bring in a transfer from Alabama A&M in Gary Qualls, a former first team SWAC all member. We talked to him at practice a few days ago. He says he can do it all. He can catch out the backfield. 
He can get between the tackles. He can block. He can return kicks. So I have little worries about this Southern running back room. Kind of reminds me of an Alvin Kamara if he can do all of those things. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, season's coming up soon. The opener on September 2nd at 5 o'clock against Alabama State. And your special is coming up this weekend on Saturday, I believe. So what can we expect from that? Uh, we can expect uh, some fun. I'll tell you that. One thing about a Southern special is not just about football. We include the fans. We include the band. We include just the overall culture of the HBCUs. But as far as on the field, we're going to give you an in-depth look at the team, what they're working with. Talk about more of that motto, good to great, which I'm rocking mm -hmm. right here on these wristbands, which is a little deeper story than just football. So, yeah, but I'm, I'm going to keep down the reps right now. <laughs> we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about, we're going to feature one of the players. His name is Robins Beauplan. His story, he's, well, actually, he's a punter, but his story as far as coming to Baton Rouge, it's a little deeper than that. Mm. And we're also going to talk about the Bayou Classic. It makes 50, 50 years this season. Of course, a lot of long history a lot of stories a lot of families are involved in this rivalry it's gonna be a good time a game that southern won last year in the yes, bayou sir. classic at what time on saturday is it airing 6 30 on okay. wafb will also be streaming on the app and on the website there you go so if you got no plans these should be your plans tune in for kevin's southern football special last year a seven and five season for eric Dooley and company a swack championship game appearance lost to jackson state but Deion sanders is gone so maybe Good to great. Be a great season for Southern this year. Yeah, man. Coach Prime, hope you have fun out there in Colorado. I think <laughs> yeah. he takes his lumps his first year. But that, that's another topic for yeah. another day. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. I'm sure we'll get into that. Well, Kevin, thanks for joining us. Yes, We're looking sir. forward to the season, and we'll have you back on soon, of course. So. Yes, sir. All right. That wraps up Game Time Episode 5. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. Be sure to tune in every Tuesday and Thursday. We'll be back next week with more LSU, more Southern, more Saints as well. And be sure to like and subscribe on YouTube and follow us on the socials at WAFB on the X app. And check us out, wafb.com slash game time. See you guys next week.